Well, we are in Luke chapter 15. I don't have my clicker today, Susan, so you're clicking away. I'll, I'll, I'll lead you through it. But uh, Luke chapter 15, 1 through, 1 through 10, uh, it's titled, uh, A Sheep and a Silver. A Sheep and a Silver. Both these are very important to the people during Jesus' day. Sheep are important and silver are important. Um, I've got four more times to speak. Today, next Sunday, next Sunday night, and the Sunday after that. And so I really want to encourage you. I, I'm going to try to do my very best by the Word of God to give you what it says here. And, um, I, and I thought too, you know, I should give little one pointer each, son, each time. So here's the pointer. As a new pastor's coming in, who hasn't pastored a church before, but well-trained, um, one thing you could do is fill in the gaps. For a young pastor, um, we kind of have a long sanctuary. So if you just think about that, the more that you congregate together and he's able to see your eyes, um, there's some dark corners back there. Uh, it's, it's encouraging. It is. So just I'll give you a pointer every time I speak. But silver and sheep are important. So a recap from chapter 14 is this. Jesus was at a dinner with a leading Pharisee. And while he's being fed, Jesus is feeding those that are at the table with him. And Jesus gives them this three-course meal. He talks to them about three things. First off, Jesus reveals their blatant, their blatant hypocrisy. They, they, they have treated the Sabbath in such a way that you couldn't even show mercy on the Sabbath. So he, he offers up the appetizer of this blatant hypocrisy. And then he moves to the main course and he speaks about their lack of humility. He had watched them enter into the dinner time and they were all jockeying for positions to have the best place at the table. And so he speaks about that. And then he moves on to dessert, and he reveals their rejecting of God's hospitality. They, they, they reject God's invitation to his banquet. And then after he gets through that part of the meal, then he turns his focus to uh, the cost of what it means to follow after Jesus. And he puts it this way, if you're going to follow after Jesus, you need to renounce four things. And the first one is you've got to renounce your people you got to renounce your people because you got to put someone else in number one place in your life, and that's Jesus Christ. And then you need to renounce your plan, that it's not your plan anymore that you're following after. It's God's plan for your life. The third thing you got to renounce is your possessions. They are not your possessions anymore. They are His. Actually, He provided them for you, but He provided them for you to use for His glory. And then the fourth one is you need to renounce your pride. It is not you going under your own power anymore. You rely on God's power to see things happen. So that's chapter 14. We come right out of chapter 14 into chapter 15 in the Greek. There's no breaks. There's no numbers. It's like he is continuing on with what he's talking about. And so verse 1 says this, All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And if you want to circle a word, you'd circle the word listen. Because the last verse in chapter 14, the last half of the verse says, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. So here he has a group of people coming, doing exactly what Jesus just said. He who has ears to hear, listen. So back to verse 1 again, it says all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And then verse 2 says, and the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now you'll notice here there's two groups. There's two groups that are present. There's the sinners on this side who are listening. And then you have the scribes on this side that are complaining you got the sinners over here who are listening. You've got the scribes and the Pharisees over here who are complaining. 
That's important to grab a hold of that because as he goes through this passage, your eyes are going to be directed to one group or the other at times. Um, now, he's been accused of this before, and I'm only going to look in the Gospel of Luke here. At other times, he's been accused of doing this, of being with tax collectors and sinners. Chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, it says this, Then Levi, who was a tax collector, hosted a great banquet for him, for Jesus, at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were guests with them, but the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining at his disciples, Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, if we just go ahead a little bit, Luke 7, verse 39, Luke 7, 39, it says, when the Pharisee who had, who had invited him, meaning Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, this man, Jesus, if he were a prophet, would, he, would, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She is a sinner. And then if we jump all the way ahead to Luke chapter 19, chapter 19, this is when Jesus is along the road and little Zacchaeus is up in the tree and Jesus comes up and calls out his name and tells him, come on down because I'm going to your house today. And we could sing the little song. But in verse 7, the response to this, verse 7 says, all who saw it began to complain, he's gone to stay with a sinful man. And this just plays out a huge difference. The Pharisees, the Pharisees wanted nothing to do with sinners. And Jesus wanted everything to do with sinners. I hope you see that difference right there. The Pharisees wanted nothing to do with sinners. But Jesus wanted everything to do with sinners. So, because of that, we go into verse 3. So he, Jesus, told them this parable, and I told you this before, uh, parable, para, para means alongside of, so here's a story that's told alongside of a truth. So there's a truth he wants you to know, he's going to tell you a story to help explain that truth. So verse 4, what man among you who has a hundred sheep? And loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it. Now, um, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to really stretch these scribes and Pharisees. Because he's saying to them, he's asking the Pharisees and to hypothetically think of themselves as unclean shepherds. And that's going to be hard for them. Because the shepherds were on the bottom of the totem pole. They were lowest on the caste system. They were unclean. They were dirty. They were uneducated and everything. And so he's making a stretch here to say to the Pharisees, okay, just think about it. Just think. Hypothetically, I know you're not shepherds. I know you're not in that class. But if you were one, if you were one and you had a hundred sheep and one was lost. Now, the typical flock for a family was 15 was 15 sheep. So if you have 100 sheep, that's, whoo, that's a lot. Most likely what Jesus is talking about is a town, a small town, that would gather all their sheep together. And as they have all the sheep together, there's not just one shepherd, there's many shepherds that are out there at different times, probably taking shifts with these 100 sheep, but one has gotten away. But rule number one is don't lose the sheep. Don't lose a sheep. If you would have been come home and you told dad, dad would have said to you, hey, how'd it go today? Oh, it went really well. Yeah, yeah, we, we only lost one today. Dad would have blew a gasket. What? Because sheep were so valuable to them. So rule number one, everybody knew this rule. Even the Pharisees knew this rule. You don't lose sheep. And so this would have been the obvious, the obvious response. Even a stretch for these Pharisees to think of themselves as unclean shepherds, their response would have been, obviously, you would go and you would leave the rest of the sheep with these other shepherds and you would go find that sheep. That's the obvious response. So verse 5, when he, the shepherd, had found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. I want you to notice there it says when. It doesn't say if he found it. As when, because he would have known if he would have came home and said, well, dad, I gave it a good try. Dad would have said, 
get back out there again. No, it's when you find it. And we think of a little lamb, the wee little lamb. But that's not what the text says. The text says a sheep, which could be 70 to 75 pounds. 70 to 75 pounds, picking it up, putting it over his shoulder, grabbing both legs and carrying it all the way home. I don't know, are you starting to feel the weight of that? But here's the beautiful thing. The sheep comes home on the shoulders of another. That's how a sheep comes home. A sheep always comes home on the shoulders of another. Always comes back on the shoulders of another. Not under their own power. It's under the power of someone else that that sheep comes back home. So verse 6, and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together and saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. You could circle the word my there. So just as obvious as it is to find the lost sheep, it's equally, equally obvious to have a celebration, to have a celebration after this is. And the shepherd didn't find someone else's sheep, but he found his own sheep. This sheep was so precious to him. Verse 7, I tell you, so Jesus speaking, so Jesus' authority on this, I tell you in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. So Jesus says here, in the same way, what he's saying there is Jesus is going to give us the meaning of this parable. We don't have to wonder what this parable means. He gives us the meaning right out. And then can you see Jesus' point? Can you see him pointing? Can you see him when he says that? There's more joy in heaven when one of these in the center group over here repents. Then over to this group over here where 99 uh, uh, righteous people don't need repentance and he says that out of sarcasm because who needs to repent do only this group need to repent no what we all need to repent right so he says it as a scar sarcasm to them and then one more point here is what makes heaven joyful what makes heaven joyful what makes god smile well, when I do a good deed, that's what makes God smile. Oh, he just loves it when I do a good deed. Oh, well, we, we, there's nowhere in Scripture that says that. But there is a place in Scripture that says God smiles. There is joy in heaven. He'll say it actually twice. There's joy in heaven when someone, a sinner, repents. That's when joy erupts in heaven. When people repent, when people are carried back home, on the shoulders of the shepherd. Heaven rejoices. Now, if we look backwards, if we look backwards, the sign of Christianity is the cross. And that's a good sign for Christianity. It makes you think of the cross, sacrifice us there. But before that, it was a fish. It was a fish. We are fishers of men. That's a Greek symbol for that. But before that, it was a shepherd carrying a sheep. That was the sign of Christianity, a shepherd carrying sheep. And uh, it, 1910, Luke 1910, he came to seek and save what? The lost, the lost. Now here's a picture, here's a picture from the third, mid third century, and this is an etching in the catacombs. And when the Christians were under heavy persecution, they went into the tombs and they worshiped there. And here's an etching on, in the catacombs, and what is it of? A shepherd, what? Carrying a sheep. That's the picture. Now, let me draw this out a little bit farther. The shepherd does the seeking. The shepherd does the finding. The shepherd does the lifting. The shepherd does the carrying. The shepherd does the restoring. And the shepherd does the leading of the celebration. The shepherd is the one who does all of those things. If you don't know this, our God is a seeking God. He is seeking to save those who are lost. He is seeking those who are lost. 
Um, somebody might say, I found God. Oh yeah, I found God. <laughs> I kind of understand what you're saying there, but, but really, no, you didn't. God found you. And he made it possible for you to see him. That's how much he's in control. You have no salvation without God opening blind eyes and softening hardened hearts. Because we are all blind until God opens up our eyes. And our hearts are all hard. He softens. He actually gives us a new heart. A new heart to be patterned after him. This shepherd is really important. So now Jesus goes on and he's going to tell a second story. Verse 8. Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. Now, if it was a stretch before to think hypothetically, Pharisees, think of yourselves as an unclean shepherd. Now he's asking them to hypothetically think of themselves as a woman. Whew, that's even worse. I mean, that, that women were second class. I'm not saying this. In their time, second class citizens, they would have never, they prayed against being a woman. That they would pray in the morning, I am so thankful, I'm a man. That's what they would pray. So now Jesus is really stretching it for them, saying, okay, guys, if you were, if you just think for a moment, if you were a woman and you lost a coin, wouldn't you do this? Well, with the bartering system, coins went a long ways. The bartering, so they would barter. So having 10 coins, uh, it's probably a silver coin, day's wage, but it would go a long, lot longer than that. It could have been her dowry um, that she would have taken in marriage. Um, it could have been woven in her hair. Sometimes they would do that. Coins would have a hole in it. And, and to keep it in safe keeping, they would weave it into their hair. And so she could be going through her hair and maybe... Ooh, one of them fell out somewhere and lost it. It could be all the money that she had, these 10 coins that are there. And again, this is the obvious response. This would have been the obvious response. If you lost one, it's not like today. They, they wouldn't be saying, well, it is what it is. I'm tired of that one. Please don't say that to me. It is what it is. Yeah. It, that's just a replacement for what we, we used to say, easy come, easy go. Remember that? Yeah, easy come, easy go. But they didn't think the way we think. They, they would think, oh, you got 100, oh, you lost one. Well, 99, come on, what you complaining about? You know, or 9 out of 10 isn't bad. They wouldn't do that. The obvious response would be to do exactly what this woman did and sweep the house and get down on her hands and knees and fight, you know, take all the furniture out until she could find it. So, uh, Another interesting thing I learned this week as I was studying this passage is that Jesus is using the images of Psalm 23, that beautiful psalm of King David's. Verse 1 says, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. First illustration he gives in this chapter 15 is about a shepherd. And then in verse 5 it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Who prepared tables during Jesus' day? Was it the men who did that? No, it was the women who prepared the tables. And what's our second illustration? It's about a woman that's there. So it goes on to verse 9, very similar. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me because I found the silver coin I lost. Again, just make note again, it says when and not if. When and not if, if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to find this. Now, I want to take us on a little bit of a rabbit trail in the Gospel of John before I go to the next point. This isn't on your slides at all. But in John chapter 6, verse 39, I, just in that light of this, the last thing I do, John chapter 6, verse 39, Jesus says, This is the will of Him, God, who sent me, Jesus, that I should lose none of those He, God, has given me. Jesus, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Now, let's go to John chapter 10. 
John chapter 10, starting at verse 16, Jesus again speaking. He says, but I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and then there will be one flock and one shepherd. Then go a little farther in that passage to verse 27, Jesus speaking again. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never, they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Then if we go to chapter 17, that beautiful prayer of Jesus. In verse 6, chapter 17, verse 6, Jesus says, I have revealed your name, meaning God's name, to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Verse 12, he goes on to say, while I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction, so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And then if we go to chapter 18, verse 8 and 9, Jesus is in the garden and he's being captured. There's some of the disciples have been grabbed. Jesus says this in response in verse 8, I told you I am he, Jesus replied. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. Let them go. This was to fulfill the words he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given me. There is a great security in your salvation when the shepherd has carried you home on his shoulders. I'll throw one more verse in here from Romans. Romans chapter 11 that Paul gives us. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. He tells these Christians, I I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. There's a fullness of people who are going to come uh, to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's the last thing I do, it's almost like Jesus is saying it. If the last thing I do, I'm going to bring all my sheep home. Every last one of them. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. Remember that? Bringing in the sheep. Well, verse 10 says, we're back to the slides again. Or, or wait, I didn't give all that, did I? Go back. Click, 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 click click again. There we go. Same response to finding is a celebration. And then the last thing there is both let others know what had happened. Just to note that, that in the sheep and the coin, that when the shepherd got back, he called other shepherds to tell them that he found the sheep. And the woman, when she had found the coin, she called her neighbors together and tell them that she found the lost coin. There was a gathering together of the people to know this information that something had been found. Now let's go to verse 10. He says, I tell you, there again is Jesus' authority. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. If you see it again, Jesus is pointing again. He's pointing to the sinner group. And the next thing there, what is necessary for joy to erupt in heaven? What's necessary? Repentance. Repentance. There's the Greek word for it there. And repentance basically means to change one's mind. That's probably the simplest definition you can give to it. To change one's mind, but it makes you ask this question, to change one's mind about what? Well, to change your mind about God, to change your mind about sin, to change your mind about your position before Him, to change your mind that you're good enough 
but rather you're a sinner saved by His grace. It's a changing of your mind. And Jesus is setting them up for the last story. He's getting them all set up for this. Jesus will go from this obvious response. He's going to go from this, well, yeah, you would go out and get the sheep. Yeah, you would sweep up the whole house to get the coin. He's going to go into a third story next week where he's going to give them a story where it's not so obvious. They're actually going to go, hey, that's not right. He shouldn't do that. So one more look at these Pharisees, and it's this. The Pharisees say, clean up and then come. If you just clean up a little bit, then you can come. Jesus turns around and says, come and I'll clean you up. I want you to see how opposite they are. And then ask yourself this question. Do you detect some Pharisee in you? Do you make groups? And they're in a group over there. And they're okay if they stay in the group over there. They stay over there. Do you have any Pharisee in you to isolate yourself from them? Or here's a second question, last question. Are you focused on complaining or celebrating? That'll tell you what group you're in. Are you focused all on complaining? You complain about this, complain about that, complain about the music, about the volume, about the temperature, about this or that. Your life is just all about complaining? Or is your life about celebrating? And of course, within this passage of Scripture, what kind of celebration are we talking about? We're talking about sheep coming home. We're talking about repentance. Is your life about celebration in the sense that you're concerned about other people knowing about Jesus Christ? Or is it filled up with complaining? Which one are you in? Again, let me say one last time. How many sinners were in that room? All of them. All, that's the right answer. All of them. There's just some in the room that thought they weren't. And that's who Jesus is really talking to. Let's make sure that we remember that we are sinners and we are so thankful that we are saved by His grace that the shepherd has opened up our eyes, softened our hearts, picked us up, put us on his shoulders, and we've come home under his total power. And we can say, thank you, Jesus. And then look out and go, oh, there's another one. I wonder if they know about this shepherd. I, I wonder if they know about the one who can carry them home and take him back to the fold. And if there's going to be celebration in heaven, it's going to be over that. I know that for sure, because he tells us it's going to be over that. Worship band, come on up and let's close in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. I thank you that the story is not done. You have one more to give us next Sunday in, related, in relationship to this. You, you bring it right home. You, you don't talk about sheep. You don't talk about coins. You talk about a person, an actual breathing person, and your finger gets pointed even closer to the issue at hand. Lord Jesus, I pray that if we would find ourselves complaining, that we would know that we weren't carried home to do that. We were carried home to be a part of a celebration and to participate in more celebrations because something was lost and it was found. So, Lord, help us to put our complaining away. And help us, Lord, to be where you would be, speaking about you, the great shepherd. Thank you, Lord, for their, your word this, again this morning. It's precious. In thy precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close?